I understand what it feels like to be ripped apart inside and have to repair that. Wow, we would have never believed this. We're on Spotify, we're on Apple, we're on Google. Go out there and listen to us, so we're excited about it. We're glad you're excited about it too. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Rizzo and I'm here with Nick Vallajos. Um, we're doing what we call Mentality Unleashed. What is that? Well, it's a 12-week series that's focusing on something specific. Being a man ain't easy in today's day and age. There's a million different reasons why. We have luxuries that we've never had access to in our time. We have difficult times, difficult subjects that we've never had difficulties with. Um, depression is number one reason why people are not working right now. Um, and, and then on top of that, we are having to be the leaders of our homes. We're having to be great husbands. We're having to be good fathers, which is the most important jobs of our lives. And that's not easy. Keeping our families together is not easy. So this is what we're doing is we're passing on 12 different stories of men who have been through the trenches, who have been through the grind, who have dealt with their insecurities, those wounds, who found their adventure, but also they've also found their beauty and rescued her. This is our story of how we've done that. Um, today's a little different though, um, but first let me go into our, um, our sponsor, it's Covenant Coffee. You know, this is something, again, we say a million episodes every time, but it's about foster kids. Foster kids are the one subgroup that we can say are orphans. And if there's anything the Lord spoke about in our Bible, he said the number one true religion, if there's anything above all religions, actually it was James, he said is to be with the fatherless and the motherless. So Covenant Coffee does just that. And not only do they do that, they employ those foster kids and they also um, give them new opportunities. So shout out to them and to the great coffee. Um, but back to our episode today, where we're gonna do something a little different. Um, Nick, Big Daddy Nick, Nicky V, uh, <laughs> he's going to interview me. And this is something that's different for me because I've never really told my story on air. Um, so this is uh, going to flip the script. Nicky V, go ahead, my man. Yeah, and just so the audience knows, he doesn't really know what I'm going to ask him. So... Nice yeah, a, a little bit of our stories. I've seen uh, Dr. Johnny Rizzo over here. Uh, really, I've seen a lot of his life. I would say the last 13, 12, 13, 11 years, in that range, we, um, I got to see a, a character arc, all right, yeah. for this guy. Yeah. So I want to start in a very difficult spot for you. A uh -huh. question I have for you is, well, let me say this. I thought... Um, my boy Johnny here was dead. Okay, it's not funny. It is kind of funny because he lived with me for a little while, and he'll get into that in a second. But I come home and he's like in his room, and he's like laying. You can't see me because this is audio, but he's if, unless you're watching it. I don't know. But he's no, like laying see. on one of those. He's he, he's laying on one of those little balls. Those like hard, kind of you know. It was like a. It was like. A, it was one a of those balls ball, that like used a to massage. Ball. Yeah, as a yeah, as yes. a handball, but they used it to massage you. Yeah, yeah, and he was laying, and his like tongue was kind of. I'm, I'm, I might be making too much of it, but he's like laying. He's like, I think he's half naked. It's on its back, yeah. and he's just laying yeah. there. Yeah. And I can't tell if he's breathing or what. He like passed out on this thing. It like left a mark on his back, and I'm like, bro. Yeah, I was bleeding um, upwards. What? What? Are you okay? And, and the reason <laughs> I want to start there. It's because there's a lot that led up to that. And I want to know, Johnny, like how you got there to that spot. You know, you know talk um, about a big arc, you know, a yeah. big arc. I've had a big arc in my life. I was an early riser um, going to university. And, and A, but just know this, the area of the most difficult life, my weakest area in life is being in the classroom. Let's just start there. No matter what, I'm the, yeah. like, the worst student ever. Um, so, um, but in my early twenties, I was working hard. I got married. I found a woman who I thought was the love of my life. And, you know, I, I was, I was doing my grind. You know, I was trying to prove to everyone I wasn't a failure. I wasn't an idiot just cause I couldn't, I didn't, I had a hard time learning as a kid and, and I was going to school full time. 
and working full time. And I worked at juvenile hall. So I was a juvenile correction officer. So I was doing graveyards, tons of graveyards, and I was going to school during the day. Um, and at the time, um, my wife, she uh, she was doing her thing. She was in her grind. Right. So doing our grind, doing our thing. And we we're having typical relationship issues, but nothing out of the ordinary. Um, and we were working hard. And all of a sudden, one day I came home mm -hmm. and and this is hard, man. And one day I came home and she's just like, I don't love you anymore. I was like, what? What you talking about? Come on, get out of here with this stuff. You know, you know, the typical love, typical stuff. You're like, nah. She's like, nah, I, I don't love you. She's like, I don't know if I ever did. She's like, I'm not attracted to you. She's like, I, I don't want to be with you anymore. You know, and, and, and I was just, I was about 26, 27 at the time. And I, just, I was like, what? It blew my mind. Now I was a kid, I was like 26. It blew my mind because I didn't know something like that could happen to me. You know, I, I had a, a pretty achieved life where I've, I've taken care of myself. I've taken care of everything. I've taken care of my own. I lived in a big house. We had nice, me and my ex had nice cars. And all of a sudden she's like, I don't want to be with you anymore. So I went from being in a 2,600 square foot home, having a nice BMW, um, uh, to living in Nick's 300 square foot uh, bedroom that room. I had built. I had it built <laughs> in the room. middle of my house. I had like room. 20 roommates, like crazy. So not only did I, you know, and she ended up doing, she ended, and I don't want to get into that. It ended up getting of course, really bad. Yeah. It ended up getting yeah. really bad where I had to leave the home and it was really unfair circumstances. And it broke me because I followed all the rules. I followed all the laws. I've done everything right. And, no, yeah. and I still got dumped. I still lost everything. And that's why that led up to you, me in the room. So in order for me to survive at that time, I was in a full on internship, eight to five. Yes. And I was and and probation, I was on a very good standing with them. They gave me a leave of absence so that I could do that internship full time. Well, when my ex left me, I had to survive. And no the internship was pretty much free. So I was like, okay, that's not gonna work. And this is the one thing that you that people need to know about me. I don't give myself options to quit. There's no option. It was never an option of, okay, I got to quit my school psychology program. It was my last year, my last quarter of the semester, I got to quit to, you know, to make ends meet. No, there was no option. I went back to probation. So I was working full time, eight to five at the schools doing my internship. And then I was working at graveyards and PMs at probation on weekends. So starting from Sunday, so when Nikki V found me, let's let's do a time trace. It was he bad found me too, Wednesday, man. Wednesday night. Let me tell you my schedule of what led to that Wednesday yes. night. I would do I would um I would do a graveyard <laughs> Sunday night. And then I would go to work from eight to five on Monday. So I would not sleep. Maybe a two hour nap in my car at a gas station on Union. Right. On Union. And then, yeah, because yeah, I, I worked over there at Greenfield at a community school. And then I would go work from eight to five. I would go home. I would prep. I would do. I still had homework at the time. And then I would go to work to graveyard again. I would do another graveyard. So Monday night and then Tuesday morning, I would go back to work at the district. And then I was I would go back to work at the p.m. Or at the graveyard on Tuesday night. So I'm not sleeping. So Sunday night is the last time I slept. Well, actually, yeah, Sunday night is the last time I slept. And I'm not sleeping uh, at all until Tuesday. This is Tuesday night. I'm doing yeah. another graveyard. And then Wednesday morning, I go back to work at the district. And then at that time, Nikki V found me. I'm, I found you too, bro. Yeah. You were, and, you were, you were out. I was like, this isn't. And I, and I make fun of it, but I was like, this isn't good. Like, there's something, because he's like, keep it, you know, when you're using the little ball, like, you're like getting something out of your back. Like, it's painful, right? You literally fell asleep, like, probably in the midst of some physical pain. Because it well, feels good, too. It feels good, but you you were out. You, you were gone. Let's, let's, let's throw this other mixer in there. You yeah. know, in order for me to actually do those things, I, I was on a prescription, too. And yes. my doctor gave me Adderall. Yeah. So I was going, you know, for my Adderall in the morning. Yep. And, I, and then I would never really come down. Adderall in the morning again. Never really come down. Adderall in the morning again. Never yep. really come down. Right? Because I have to survive. And then I'm having to take Xanax. And my, doctor, my doctor gave me Xanax, to Ambien, sleep. and then to whatever sleep. else could sleep. So when you found me, I was in the most survival mode of any survival modes. I was broken in every means possible. Um, 
that was the probably one of the lowest times in my life. And that's, and the reason I wanted to start with that, because you're here at this moment. So mentorship played a, played some kind of role through that, you know, but I really wanted you to take the story now from you, um, waking up, buying a car you shouldn't have bought and having to sell it. <laughs> um, just going wild, right? For, for whatever well, I what get. Do you, I mean, what do you do when your heart's broken? I don't know, man. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's not, it's ironic. I don't even know what's the right word. Like your heart was broken and you still were going through like the toughest time of your professional career because you're going through internship, trying to work, survive in this little tiny yeah. room in the middle of my house. Um, wow. <laughs> Right. But you're here now. So I don't want to jump all the way to here. I want to, I want to jump from you almost waking up and at that moment going from, okay, I, I, I got to finish my intern. I got to get through this piece, like the next six months to the year. What was the process there? Because at some point you were like, I can't, I can't live in this despair. I you know have I've to always, do something. What, I, yeah. what I've always done is I've always been talented in certain areas. And one of the most areas that I'm talented in is, is chunking, chunking things out and just yes. grinding it one piece at a time. And I did that for years. And 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 part of and what I did and I was really strong in too is compartmentalizing. I just didn't deal with things that I was going through. I didn't deal with the pain of my ex dumping me. I didn't deal with the pain of 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 me struggling through, you know, some of my insecurities. Am I dumb? Right? Can I do this? You know, I take at the point at that point I taken I was uh, I took Adderall for about ten years, because I thought I couldn't write. I thought I had ADHD that was so impairing to me yeah. that I you needed did. this 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 these pills to help me do my job. Dude, I even think psychologically, we've had this discussion even in the last few years. How long it's taken you psychologically to realize that that isn't true, that that wasn't well, true for you. Well, I believe you could the lie. I yeah, believe the lie. A lie was that I was broken. A lie was there was something wrong with me. But where did that track from? That track from me as a kid not learning, dude. I do. I remember being in the classroom, never being available to learn. People just thought I was because I was very charismatic and I can talk well. People always thought I was I had more in me than what I had. And academically, dude, I never had it. I can't tell you often. I was trying to learn. I was trying to get those math equations. I was trying to get the writing down, and I just couldn't get it. So you know, imagine. You know, I started off at BC learning fractions. What, dude? And there was this, it was special ed kids next to me. Imagine, like, that's what I went through. So, you know, fast forward, I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I was so a So you're, not only you're in internship, you, you are still part of the, going to school at some level, right? Because internship's a piece of it, so to go to class. You're still in that, like, I don't know if I can, it, it, even though you, you're, you're highly intelligent, you're like, man, it's school, I don't, you're going through a divorce, right? You you don't know where your net your job's gonna be after your intern. You just don't know these things when you're a school psychologist, an intern. You have to find a new job. You have to grind. You got to be the top level because there's a lot of competition there. You're working in a kind of a the environment you're working in already is negative, right? Because you have to do things you don't want to do, right? You have you have to you know you're with you're with students that are incarcerated or you know whatever it may be. You're <laughs> you're in a you're in, you're in a spot you're in a bad yeah. you're in a psychologically it's i don't know how you how would you crawl out tell me what's well, like the one or two things you did to crawl out of that because it'd be easy to not be here now it wasn't healthy ways it wasn't healthy ways i, I understand that i i partied pretty hard yep and um and when i mean i partied hard is i just i just stopped caring about my behavior I stopped yes. caring. And when I stopped caring about behavior, I stopped caring about what I cared about. And therefore, that was like, I had that numbness. And I was good with that. Because you know what, man? I was a dang good psychologist with that numbness. I was, I was a high achiever. I was producing results. I was getting a ton of attention. But you know what really killed me, man, is, is I was doing all that. But I still had this void. I still didn't know how to be a good husband. And at that, like, fast forward five, like, six years later... You know, I have a new woman in my life, right? And yes. and that's what there was a point where even though I was able to crawl out of all that, and I would say I did it in unhealthy ways, it caught up to me when I got married with Melissa, because yeah. I was like, I need to stop all these behaviors. I need to stop taking these pills to survive to do my job. I need to stop drinking. 
I need to stop being a wild man. And I had to do all that. And I didn't know how. Okay. So you didn't know how, and you, and like you said, there was some unhealthy things, but at some point you turn it around and, and it was when you, I remember when you met Melissa and like, you were like, there was something different. Like this is, this was good for you, right? She was good for you. Oh, yeah. uh, and you got married. And so you, who was there for you throughout this process from, Hey, Jonathan, I, I don't love you anymore. I'm out of this. Shakes your whole, destroys your whole idea of reality. Did you have a really nice house? You lived in the nice neighborhood. You had the car. You had the wife. You had the church, right? You had the parents. You had everything. And then boom. So who who is there? It can be peers. It can be a, uh, mentors. Who is there for you? And the reason I want to ask this is because I think people out there need to understand I, I truly believe I have faith that God will put those people in your life. You just yeah. have to let them in. You have to yeah. let them in to help you. And it might be somebody in this stage of your life, but two years from now, they may not even be in your life anymore. And that's yeah. fine. Right. Yeah. So how, just tell me who was there in, in the, during that time. During the wild days, I call wild it the, the, the reason the wild days. That was wild like post divorce. And then yeah. before I got married again, um, I had a lot of my friends. They were yeah. really there for me. You, my dog, you know, my road dog, you know, you were there for me. And boy, was that good. My brother, my brother yeah. was there for me. My, I had some best friends, uh, Josh Vietti, man, yes. that boy, he was my ride or die. Um, yeah. uh, I had my friend, Andrew Morales, you yeah. know, I, and my parents, you know, but, but can I tell you something? They were there during my wild days, but <laughs> you know, they're a part of those wild days. <laughs> You know, they were a part of the wild stories. Yeah. Can I tell you what changed? There was a big difference. So I got married again and it was hard. And, and I was not about to lose another woman. Losing a woman is one of the worst things the man can do. And I wasn't going to do it again. I just it, wasn't. it has to be up there, man. I mean, even biblically, like when that is ripped apart, like you are one. Think about that. I, I believe when the Bible says you, you are, it's you're one. That that's what you are. That it, it's a rip. I don't even know how you you can't really rip I, that apart. How do you I'll really tell you rip what, that apart? I understand what it feels like to be torn apart. That's you have to at that. Point. I understand yeah. what it feels like to be ripped apart inside, mm -hmm. and have to repair that. Right. Hey. So you know what changed is I changed. I had to change some of the people that were in my life, and I didn't remove my friends because they're still my best friends. You guys are all still my best friends, but it, um. I, had, I talked to Pastor Tom. I said, Tom. And, and you know why? Because I knew church had to be a part of my story. It, and I didn't think it needed to be my journey. You know, I'm not meant to go work for the church and things like that. I just knew it was a part of my story. And I felt like I didn't belong there. And I felt like I didn't have good traction on my marriage. And, and on top of that, like, of course, I can go to my parents. And I did go to my parents. But at times, you want somebody outside of that. And that's yes. when I talked to Pastor Tom. And he's like, all right. I do got vision for you. And I was like, man, I was so happy about that. Like, dang, somebody's going to bring me inside in the fold. Okay. But then he was like, you got to go to Cal State. I was like, whoa, I'm an East Sider. He was like, you got to start a Bible study. And I'm, I'm just coming out of my wild days. Right. <laughs> and then, um, and then he told me I have to meet with him every Wednesday for an hour. And I hate talking to people for an hour, but those were the things that he did. But when he did that and him, this guy, Glenn Allen, you know, the first things that they worked on, my marriage. And that's why I was like, I'm in. I'm in with this mentoring because the one thing that you're going to work on, the one thing you're actually going to focus on me redeeming, you're not going to try to plug me into some ministry and make me some youth pastor and have me do all this volunteer stuff at the church. They were like telling me to go spend more time with my wife. You know, that's the stuff they worked on, dog. So that's to well, me. That, that's your ministry. Like here's, for all of you out there that are, are married, men, I... Listen, I understand like that you are called. We are all called and we have things to do at the church. But listen, if you're you have to have your marriage has to be in order. It has to be in order. Like there shouldn't be any compromise there. Like that has to be first because God, I think God has made it that way. Like yep. that that's something yep. he's ordained. Yeah. So live in that. Yep. That is your ministry. Yeah. Or a yep. significant part of it. And I think that's what I loved about them is that's what they focused on. And then 
they were they told me through that I will be a good father. Yes. And that's something I heard my whole life from my dad. But I needed to hear it and I needed somebody else to guide me at that point. Right? I saw it. You know, there's those there's, 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 there's child parent, not conflicts, but just, you know, there's other people that need to be a part of every child's story. And that's where Pastor Tom came and he just he not only guided me through my marriage, that's just where he started. Yes. You know what he also helped me with is at that same point I was having, you know, fast forward, I was doing really good in my career, but I was just burned out. I was tired. I was commuting to Porterville. I was commuting to Porterville uh, five years. I was commuting two hours a day. I was in a full time doctoral program. So not only was I commuting five years, I was going to school. At, at Cal State Bakersfield in a doctoral program for so I was just yeah. I was burned out. So by the time Pastor Tom got a hold of me, I was I was already finished my program. I didn't want to be in education anymore. I didn't even want to be in mental health anymore. I was exhausted and I wasn't a good husband. So he fixed the first part, which is being a husband. And can I make a and, point to that? Sorry yeah, to go, cut go, you go, off, go. but I have to say yeah. this. When you are in a state of exhaustion tired, hungry, mad, upset. Don't let those feelings and the way, don't let that really dictate how you feel necessarily about your profession. Because I remember with you, Johnny, it was like the position you're in right now. You remember that, huh? I remember the whole thing. So you were telling, you were kind of looking for, you were looking for a way out. And I was like, well, wait, wait, let's talk. Let's talk about this. Why are you looking? Oh yeah, because you're commuting two hours a day. Because the amount of work you're doing over there was, was not feasible. As opposed to, no, it wasn't the profession you wanted out of. You wanted out of that specific situation. Yeah. So don't conflate. Yeah. People, don't conflate. You know, what is your passion? And maybe you're in a spot and you have the passion, but it's not working in that area. You look, You can look for ever, other avenues there, right? 100%. Well, heck yeah, dude. Heck yeah. And I think that's where... It, that helped me at that time. Yes. And, and, and for that mentorship process, it didn't stop there. Cause you know what it happened is what Tom did along with, you know, my dad yes. and everybody else in my life, it worked. But you know what I had to do, Nick is in order for me to really grow with that too, along with that mentorship is I had to put in the work. I had to put yes. in the grind. Yes, Bro, sir. I had yes, those. So I had to get off those pills and yes. I, and everyone supported me. I needed everyone in my life to do that because I wasn't addicted to them. But I no. believe that I needed them to do a job. You, and I had you were to using them functionally. Line. You were using them functionally. And we do want to state that we understand we're not here trying to say you can't take medication, take medication. But in, in Johnny's situation, he knew he, he was under this thought process, especially from the system he came from in the school district and not when he was a kid, didn't work out like, you know, he, he needed something to focus. And now, now well, he's on something that and like put him in the situation he was in. And, and, you know, the, the big thing me and you knew the purpose of medication yeah. was only to apply in order to increase the skills and then That's fade it. out. That's how and you, I had you, to be, to and it. I had to practice what I preached. So I had to face that. And you know what I had to do is I finally had to come to a lifespan instead of relying on my, ta my, ha my talents, instead of relying on my pills, instead of relying on this, um, I, I could perform. I had to finally develop back up and develop habits to sustain who yes. I was and become the man that I wanted to be. Oh, there's, there's practicality to what you're doing is what you're saying right now. That's something that I think it needs to be said and cannot be understated. It's, it's like there's a you can have a systematic approach for success, yep. which starts with God. Yep. And then you yep. had somebody like Pastor Tom and your dad and your family yep. and your friends. Like having – for those of you out there that are, are Christians, like – don't don't get so caught up in the clouds. You don't you don't realize there's more there's work to be done, and you can you need to take these approaches. You need to take a systematic approach as a man to be successful, right? It's it's the same as like, well, I want to get married. Well, are you doing anything? Are you doing anything to prepare yourself for that? Well, I trust God. Well, sure, go get, go get in your car right now and trust that you're not getting an accident and die. But you, you know maybe you should wear your seatbelt still. But are you preparing, yep. you know, for the, for what could happen? Yep. Yep. 
And I think that's where I had to practice what I preach. I had yeah. to, I, what I did is I had to reteach myself. Remember all therapy is everyone simple. It's reteaching, replacing, mm -hmm. changing how you think and then yes. building skills. That's all it is. And what I had to do is I had to perform therapy on myself because if you perform therapy on yourself, you won't need therapy. And part of that yeah. therapy process is I had to learn who I was. I had to learn some habits and the habits that I had to learn is the ones that my dad and Tom told me simple stuff like journaling. Yeah. Because people think mentorship is actually very effective. If you act if you have a mentor that is a God loving man, like pastor Tom, like if you just listen, but not, but what I mean, listen in action. Yeah. That, that's how, yes. you know, we all need a little, we all need direction at some point. Right. And we have the Holy spirit, obviously, but God works through the Holy spirit and others to tell you what you need, like show you what you need to do. And, and, Accept what you have going on. I'll yeah. say what's funny about you, dude. You'll like, you'll call me. There's a whole story with the kid and the machete, and like you called me and told me about that story. But you're like, man, I'm like in a lot of trouble. And I'm like, well, did you do what you were supposed? And like, you've always been good at. We're gonna, we're gonna. I know we're gonna end in a couple minutes, but that was a crazy part of your journey of like you did what you thought was right, but you you laughed at it because you know you know what may not be good for me to really help this kid. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that's, you know, he supported the student. It was a, it was a tough situation. Hey, but, that's, hey, but that's the guy I want to be. I want to yeah. be the man that does what's right. I want to be the man that does what produces the best results. Stop giving me policies. Stop giving yes. me rules. Stop giving me your books. Show me what produces the best results for change. And you'll do it. Show it to me. And then yep. tell me your process and then teach me your process. And that's what this whole series is. That's what this whole series is. And I, and I, I think this is like so, so needed. Um, and that, that kind of gives me to my lap. Here's my last question for you is where, what now? Because you're here, right? And people can just kind of glide on. You could dude, you can not change anything and you're going to have a nice life, a nice, yeah. just easy life but what not easy but you know what i mean like you you've made it in a I lot of people's mind you can have a nice life here i can but, be comfortable now but what's next i would i would rather i'd rather die than be comfortable <laughs> thank you i want to okay. hey you know what i you know you know what i'm doing now nikki v i'm pushing the limits in every area of my life so i'm a full-time school psychologist and i've done a good job at that in the sense of where you know, I've automated things. I have interns that want to come that volunteer to work for me for free to learn. So I have a very good job that's very sustainable that I can manage a lot of different things at one time. So I'm a, I'm a full-time employee there. And then I'm also a professor at Fresno Pacific University where I do a lot of the research and mentoring for the last year uh, students. But then what I've also done is throughout this whole time, you know, I believe in what we do in mentoring and I believe in what Tom did for me. So I actually started my own group. When he said, hey, Johnny, I need you to start your own small group. I did that. I stayed yes. in the trenches for five years. I didn't have people show up for two years. And now I've had people showing up for the last three to four years. So I've been doing the mentoring and that's weekly. And I do it Thursday, 6 a.m. If you want to show up, babe, if you want a piece of me, Thursday, 6 a.m. And I do it early because I only want the hungry to come. You ain't going to come and let me entertain you at 6 a.m. You're going to be hungry. So, you know, yeah. I'm doing the, the, the Bible study. And I'm doing all this stuff for that I can for uh, mighty men through the church. But then the last thing that I've started doing is I started my own business. So I'm a, my, my own clinician. I have, I have my, the degrees and licensing and all that stuff. And my wife does. So we started our own business. And Nikki, we're doing my passion, baby. Well, I'm not go, only man. in the schools. I'm not only working with the parents, the teachers, the principals, now I'm pushing into the homes. And I, I yeah. get to hire clinicians, I get to hire behavioral therapists, they get to work with the kids eight hours a week. So I have my own business where I can really make a big impact and be independent. And I'm also doing this. Show Nick, that book I'm in also, front of you. Show that yeah, legacy, I'm also a liberated the ground, mind. Baby. No, no, Look so that one's wild at heart. And oh. both to together, there's a practicality with the spiritual right there. These two both of things, those together. Yes. These two things have changed my life.
Yes. They have been, this is when I hear is a specific framework on how to think, on how to become yes. your own therapist, on how to push yourself, on how to have yeah. that strong mentality, on how to build that resilience, on how to have that meaningful life. But this one teaches you on what it means to be a man of God. It teaches yes. you what to be a man because this mm -hmm. one didn't show me what type of journey that I needed to be on. This one didn't yeah. show me how to be a good husband. It didn't show me how to rescue that woman, but this one does. And yeah. both of these together, Amen. you know, along with the men in my life that have shown me how to do this, this is what mm -hmm. produced the man that I am today. And I'm, and, and you know, Nick, I'm scared every day and I love it because I have a process on how to deal with it. You do. I use my, do I use my adrenaline to stay hyped. I write my reflections. I shape my mentality. I shape my perspective. And then I work with that all throughout the day, baby. Yep. That's there it, is. Nikki V. That is it. What do you think, my boy? That's great, man. I'm glad. I'm glad with what you're doing. Just keep going. Don't stop. That's it, baby. Well, everyone, this is what I want you guys to know. You know, we're not here just to waste your time. I'm not here just to get attention. I'm here because we've done good work. I'm here because the men that I've had brought on that are going to be on have done the things that we want you to do. We've had our wounds. We've had our battles. We've had our big losses. We've had our failures and they don't matter. That's just nope. a part of life. That's just step one of getting to step two. And what we want to do is show you our processes. We want to show you our strategies, but not only that, we have an event on January 6th, half day. We're going to have me, Pastor Tom, Pastor Hector Rizzo, or Tom Touchstone and Hector Rizzo. Let's take the pastor out of it. You're going to have three men who have done this mentorship, who have lived this life. You have me as the clinician, but you have them as the warriors who want to take you through this process, who want to show you the strategies that we've learned, who want to take you through those hard questions that you may have, those hard experiences. We want to guide you through that process. We're keeping it small to only 50 guys. We're going to have a big bomb buffet, but we're inviting you out to join this experience. All right, Nikki V, thank you, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you being on, my boy. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Peace, Love you, man. Talk to you later. Everyone. Love you too, brother.